When I began my journey into modular synth DIY, one of the first things I discovered was Ray Wilson's book, Make Analog Synthesizers. The simple, straightforward explanations combined with his noise toaster project are laid out in a way to immediately begin applying these concepts. They are easy to understand from any level, covering each part of the circuit separately, from the power to the envelope to the VCO, with enough detail to really begin to understand how all of these parts come together to create the whole. Ray takes time to cover descriptions of the tools you need to start your DIY electronics journey. He offers ideas for setting up your studio for recording your new sound box. And he ends with an in-depth look at both the 13700, which is used to create voltage control for a large number of modules on the synth market, and he covers a number of CMOS logic chips that are necessary in the creation of clocks, gates, triggers, and many other logic operations in synth creation. Most, if not all, the information in this book can now be found online at the Music from Outer Space website. But if you are just starting your journey into electronics and modular synth, the way that Ray lays out the fundamentals while taking you step by step through this process is invaluable, and I highly recommend it. Initially, when I built my first noise toaster 10 years ago, I didn't have access to a manufactured circuit board, so I tried etching one of my own. I used this for years, but it was hardly a perfect circuit. I did my best to iron the toner transfer onto one side of the circuit and turn it over and try to align the other side. It worked, but it was off by an angle of 2 or 3 degrees. Not enough to redo it, but enough to make it a bit of a struggle to solder everything. It worked for years, but was always quirky, and finally after around 8 or 9 years I decided that I should fix it. Nowadays, it isn't necessary to etch your own double-sided circuit boards. I found out that SynthCube has purchased the rights to produce Ray Wilson's boards from his family, and I was super happy to be able to purchase a proper production circuit board. Production boards are not only properly aligned, but they also have some nice additional features, such as plated through holes and vias so you don't have to solder the components on both sides of the boards, and a protective layer over the traces so that they don't corrode and it is much more difficult to solder things that you shouldn't. The purpose of this video is not to show you a time lapse of me soldering all of these components to the board and explain the basics of this process. There are a lot of good tutorials on the topic of basic soldering out there. Rather, what I wanted to share is how I decided to change this into more of a modular project where you can patch sounds into one another. I found some articles describing the modifications that people have done to the noise toaster, most notably Kurt James Vanna. Most of what I had done is follow their simple ideas and added a couple of extras. An extra VCA, an extra VCF modulation, and a sample and hold inspired from Rene Schmidt's Yash, or yet another sample and hold. In order to make this project more modular, I needed to design a new faceplate. In the description, I'll add a link to the vector file I designed if you're interested in using it to design your own version, or to build the version I'm describing here. If people are interested in how I went about designing this, I'll add a link to the future video about this in the description. Once I had worked out what features were needed on my new faceplate, and I'd CNC'd it out of aluminum, I needed to make the connections with the circuit board. The nice thing about circuit bending the board to make it patchable to itself is that Ray designed each of the parts of the noise toaster as essentially separate modules on a single circuit board that have their own dedicated controls on the faceplate. Because of this, there are a number of switches that allow you to connect either the solar square wave or the white noise to the VCF, and if you connect these switch points to a jack instead, it becomes an output or input for each module. In order to make this video understandable, but also not an hour long, I'll describe what needs to be done in sections for each module. The VCO, VCF, VCA, LFO, envelope generator, and amp. However, this is not the best order to build the project. It's best to wire all of the necessary connections to the components attached to the faceplate before you start attaching them to the circuit board, as you will see when the video jumps forward and back in time. But I do think this is the best way to make it clear what changes need to be made for each section. After we've added all the components to the faceplate, we need to add the ground and the power supply. This follows the same setup as Ray shows in his faceplate diagram, with the addition of grounding all of the additional 8th inch pots. Then, in addition, we need to ground pin 1 of the AR mod pot and the additional external modulation pot of the VCO, as well as pin 1 of both VCF input pots and pins 1 and 2 of the cutoff frequency. Then, for the power supply connections, battery positive goes to one side of the push button gate for the envelope generator and to pin 3 of the VCO frequency control. Battery negative is attached to the VCO at pin 1 of the frequency pot and the LFO pot, as well as pin 1 of the amplifier volume pot. Pin 1 of both of the VCF modulation pots are connected to battery negative through 27K resistors as well. 
Once you have the faceplate components wired, you would need to connect the excess wire that is left to G and D, BP, and BN respectively. There are two holes for each, and which one you use is unimportant. The other hole will be used to attach the actual power. After we finish the ground and power, we will start with our modulation sources, the LFO and envelope generator. One of the advantages of using Euro rack style jacks over the banana jacks that Kurt Werner uses is that Euro rack jacks have a pin that functions as a normally closed switch when nothing is plugged into the jack. This allows us to make the normal signal connections from Ray's design to this additional pin. When nothing is plugged into our jacks, our noise toaster will function more or less the same as the original, but when we use patch cables, we can interrupt this connection and replace it with the source of our choice. The first of our two modulation sources in the noise toaster is the LFO. On Ray's schematic, this switch allows you to choose between a square wave LFO and what Ray refers to as an integrated square wave. By connecting X20 to a jack instead of a switch, you will get the output of the integrated square wave. Using the switch pins, I have taken the integrated square wave signal and routed it not only to the tip of the output jack, but also to the switch of the first VCO and VCF mod jacks. When you connect X16 to a jack in addition to pins 1 and 2 of the rate potentiometer, you get the output of the square wave. This other switch in Ray's design connects that square wave signal to a capacitor that results in what Ray refers to as a differentiated square wave. If you simply connect the square wave jack to another jack with a 1 microfarad bipolar resistor, you will get the differentiated square wave. Note that if you test your results with an oscilloscope as you go, and you try testing the differentiated square wave on its own, all you will see is a square wave. The capacitor has no effect on the square wave unless there is some impedance pushing against the output, so in order to test this, you will need to plug the jack into one of the inputs I will get to in the following sections. Now, for the attack release envelope, in the same fashion as the LFO, we will take the connection that is normally connected here at X18 and connect this to the tip of our AR output jack as well as the switch pins of our secondary modulation sources on both the VCO and the VCF. All the other connections of the AREG will remain completely the same as Ray designed it. Moving on to the VCO. Ray designed this switch to allow you to choose between the square or sol wave input, and this one to add in white noise. By taking the wires attached to these switches labeled X7, X3, and X4, and attaching them to jacks instead, you now have the outputs of the VCO and the noise generator in raw form. To maintain our normal function when jacks are not plugged in, you can connect these outputs to the switch connection of the input jacks of the VCF, which we'll get to a little later. For my circuit, I have also connected the white noise to the switch connection of my sample and hold, which is not explained in this video, but will be the topic of my next video. Looking at these potentiometers in the VCO section, the first one is just the coarse frequency of the VCO, and this we will wire up in exactly the same way. The second and third potentiometers in Ray's design are the dedicated modulation sources coming from the LFO and the attack decay envelope. The great thing here is that we can just connect pin three of these potentiometers to a jack, and now they are the modulation inputs for any source we choose to insert there. As described when wiring the LFO and the AR, the switch pin of these jacks connect to the LFO and envelope so that when nothing is plugged into these jacks, they will function exactly the way Ray intended. Ray also provides the ability to add an additional modulation source that is described in the website, and we have added it exactly as he describes here. Ray connects a switch to X6 to allow us to hard sync the VCO and the LFO. By simply connecting this to a jack, we can hard sync the VCO to any oscillator we plug in. We can't use the switch pin here to automatically connect the LFO because then it will always be on. So this is one of the only cases where a patch cable is necessary to maintain normal function. Now moving on to the VCF. There are two inputs to the VCF, X11 and X8, coming from the middle of the switches we referred to when discussing the VCO. These can be attached to pin 2 of both of our input potentiometers instead. Pin 3 of those potentiometers are connected to the tip of the input jacks. The switch connection of these jacks have already been connected to the sol and square wave outputs of the VCO so that we maintain the circuit's normal behavior. The cutoff and resonance pots are connected to X9 and X10 respectively, and there is no change from the original design here. There is one standard modulation source that is controlled from this switch in the front panel that is used to switch between the outputs of the LFO and the envelope. We can remove this switch and simply add another jack to pin 3 of the potentiometer. The output of the VCF is one of the only tricky parts that will require a small modification to the circuit board. We need to cut the trace between the drain of Q7 
and pin 1 of the op amp. This is the output of the VCF. The drain of Q7 is the input of the VCA, and we will make this connection a bit later. In order to connect the output of the VCF to a jack, we will need to solder a wire to the left leg of resistor R35. This will give us an independent output of the VCF. I had originally designed the faceplate for an additional modulation to be added to the VCF. I thought that I could just use the suggested external input mod from Ray, but after building this I realized that this is an additional input to the VCF and not an additional modulation. I still plan on adding this extra modulation, but I ran out of time for this video. I am thinking it might be possible to modulate the resonance instead of the cutoff frequency, but I need to do a bit more research to make sure that this is possible first, so look out for an update about this soon. The modulation input of the VCA requires our only other small modification to the circuit. The best way to do this is not to put R41 in its, in its designated place, but to use the clutching area instead. Then we can connect it with a wire to the left-hand connection where R41 should be. The other side of the resistor should be connected to our modulation jack. By connecting the output of the envelope to the switch pin of this jack, we can keep our normal function. The input and the output of the VCA can be found at this switch that is used to bypass the VCA for the main amplifier. X12 is the input and connects to the drain of Q7, but it is now independent from the VCF after we cut the trace. X13 is the output. By attaching these points to both a jack and two sides of a switch, we can plug anything into the VCA, but we can still use this bypass when nothing is connected and we are using it in the normal wired function. The output of our VCA should also be wired to the input switch of the audio amplifier. For our audio amplifier, we need to connect a jack to pin 3 of the volume potentiometer and pin 2 to X25 on the board. The output and the speaker connections are wired exactly the same as on the original board. Ray provides on all of his lo-fi noise box circuit boards what he refers to as kludge areas. That is this unpopulated section in the upper right hand corner where you can make additions and changes to the circuit. One of the things that I decided to add to the circuit is an additional VCA. If you talk to people who deal in modular synth circles, you are bound to hear the phrase, you can never have too many VCAs. This is true even with this noise box circuit. For one, the circuitry of this simplified VCA only requires four or five components, so it'll really easily fit in the kludge area. Another reason is that the original VCA is connected to the audio amplifier and is mainly designed to allow the envelope generator to modulate the amplifier in a classic VCA style. But one of the great things about VCAs is that you don't have to use them in this simple fashion. The noise toaster has two modulation sources, the LFO and the envelope generator, and you can use both of these to modulate the VCO and the VCF, and the envelope will modulate the VCA but what you can't do is let them modulate each other. With the addition of this simple VCA, you can modulate the LFO with the envelope and vice versa. And that's it. I hope you found this at least interesting, if not useful. Now let's check out what we've built. Thank <laughs> you.